Chapter 16 The Hunt of Eastgrim and Ursa, which was called Wolfhorn. Next day, Renard crossed the bridge without any further trouble. He expected the same sounding of the horns which for the last four days had greeted him as he came through in the morning, but nothing was heard except the porter's hearty laughter and the sound of a pebble that he threw at him falling on the path behind him. Renard was more and more pleased with himself. As he ran towards the woods, everything passed through his head. This incursion amongst men, before a lord in a fortified castle, with peasants trembling before him. Lady Flora's laughter, perhaps, and the pity she had shown him. It gave him the same pleasure as though he were chewing Redbeak's wing or Gutero's leg. But he was wrong, for he was no longer free. All the shining visions he saw went to his head. In the same way, a clump of dandelion sometimes conceals a strong herb which burns the throat and weakens the legs. It was noon, and the morning was still fresh. Perched on the festival cross, Karkar the Jay was swiftly smoothing over with his beak the blue feathers which were his pride. He saw the fox and cried out, It's Renard! Yes, it is I. I'm just coming back from the castle. I've got the better of Lord de la Fouille, his household, his huntsmen, and his dogs. Karkar flew away, and the news flew with him. A hundred yards within the forest, Lanfert could be heard singing and chopping lightly with his billhook, cutting up wood for charcoal. Renard went on to Malpass. Different thoughts passed through his head. He forgot simultaneously King Noble, the cry of the hounds, and the fantastic play of light and shade on the high ceilings at the Chateau de la Fuy. In his imagination, he saw the graceful ermeline and three little pointed noses gleaming black and he barked quietly as he ran along, like a happy fox barking in time with his own steps. <laughs> Greetings, cousin Renard. He recognised Grimbart the badger, with his short, broad paws, walking along in a flat-footed way like the bear. Yet he was Renard's cousin, with the same muscle and the same cunning eyes shining through the black stripes that circled his neck and cheeks. <laughs> I was looking for you. Grimbart went on. I heard Karkar. I ran. But take care, for I am not by any means the only one who heard his cries. What do you mean? asked Renard. Only what I say. Watch in front and behind, and look to the left and to the right also. Is somebody looking for me? Take care where you go. Grimbart was not able to say any more. Before Renard's eyes, he turned over on his back, his claws showing. And at the same moment, Renard saw it. Swooping down on him, silent and grey, came a wisp of smoke, quickly turning into a wolf, with a wolf's legs, a red gaping wolf's mouth, and wolf's teeth dripping with foam. And then began another chase. The day had not yet come when Renard could amuse himself at home, perform his toilet and enjoy the fine weather. A new chase, certainly, for the fox had not run fifty yards before making an unexpected discovery which made the sweat trickle down his spine. He was being pursued, not by one wolf, but two. Lady Ursa was taking part. It was Lady Ursa who had seen him first and swooped down on him so directly and silently. He sweated even more, when he realised that without the cunning and subtle Grimbart turning his unexpected somersault, Ursa would have leapt upon him at once and her resentful, jealous mate would have crushed him with his firm dry paw that contained bones harder than two ram's heads, his tail that always grew again, and his skin that healed so quickly, even when the lion's claws had pierced it. In one word, Eastgrim, his eternal, implacable, stupid, tough and deadly enemy. As he ran, he thought things over, what was Ursa's plan? What did she want? Could Eastgrim have rallied her so quickly and so completely to a bad husband's cause? If Ursa had taken the lead in pursuit of Renard with such gusto, was it not in order to deceive the wolf over her zeal as an outraged wife, and at the same time to ward off any unfortunate accidents? For did not any female, woman or wolf, possess that secret cunning which Renard could understand more readily than any husband? However, he doubled back and swerved about, confusing his tracks as though at will. But he spared no pains and employed all his resources, 
for he wanted to have the last word in this war with Eastgrim, which was so fierce and tense. From time to time, without relaxing his speed, he glanced over his shoulder. The forest unfolded all its leaves, and he could easily have concealed his flight among them. But how could he get rid of the acrid smell of his coat? There was an idle breeze which retained every scent and blew them about. Wolves had a keener sense of smell than bloodhounds. Renard could not shake them off like that. Should he go to Malpass? But how could he get there? The stupid Eastgrim would never be stupid enough not to cut off all access to it. Those were his tactics every time. And today, in order to keep a closer watch on him, there were two of them. Renard, still running and swerving, could not get this out of his mind. The image of a twofold wolf. This rapid pursuit was led by a twofold wolf. That was why his coat was steaming, why his bones felt soft, why, to his own amazement, he felt himself losing heart in advance. Two of them! His blood throbbed. Two of them! Was that what Grimbart had tried to suggest just now? Two behind? One to the right, the other to the left? If one was to gain greatly on him, Renard would have no choice. Wolf's jaws in front of him, and, if he turned round, Wolf's jaws behind him. A blue tit flew over his head. Why could he not fly away like a blue tit? Karkar and his brothers, their tawny wings speckled with pink or jewelled with blue, were wheeling round among the leaves. Their cries filled the forest. News! News! Who wants to hear about the wolf's pursuit of Renard the fox? We're following them. We can see everything. We can wager that Renard will soon be run to earth. Lady Ursa's breathing over him. How quickly she's running. She's so keen and light. Renard swerves all the time and doubles on his tracks. Lady Ursa's following him. She's sticking to him. It's she who'll get him. Where's the wolf, Lord Eastgrim? He's broken through. He's lost the scent. He's going straight to Malpass. He's rushing through the undergrowth and the brushwood. He's disappeared. We can't see him any longer. Renard's going up the beech glade. He's running round the great beach. Lady Ursa's still following. Her legs are moving so fast, they're almost mixed up together. Now Renard's running round the five-branched beach. He's jumping through it, between the branches that are closest together. He's gone through like a shuttle through canvas. Lady Ursa's jumped after him. She... No, she hasn't gone through. In fact, Lady Ursa had remained wedged between the trunks of the beach. There was a splendid main trunk and five branches grew straight out from it. Renard the fox had flown between two of them as lightly as a blue tit. Ursa, her teeth grasping his tail, jumped with such zest that almost half her body passed through, her neck and her forepaws, but the rest did not follow. She was caught behind the shoulders. Her ribs were badly bruised and crushed. Her tongue was hanging out, and the breath whistled in her throat. She was wedged so tightly that she could move neither forward nor backward. The jays scattered then came back, and the bravest of them perched in the very branches of the beach that held the she-wolf captive. What was Renard doing? The jays leant forward, flapping their wings and screeching. They cawed no more, but laughed loudly with insolent, interminable laughter to the shame of Lady Ursa. And the woodpeckers, with their red caps, laughed as only they know how to laugh, louder than Farrant could neigh. And Rudolph the squirrel laughed too, with delicate, quiet, throaty laughter, showing his long incisor teeth, but his somersaults and the gay plume of his fiery red tail laughed even more, and the well-behaved, serious Grimbart, who had come along greatly disturbed by the din, stood up and swayed from one leg to the other, and laughed as he had never laughed before, holding his sides and laughing until the tears ran down his face. And the cuckoo! The harvest was over, but he had found his voice again. The cuckoo was calling in the beech tree, he sang his own song, which was all he could sing, but he sang it, and he sang it well. Cuckoo wolf! Cuckoo wolf! No song in all the forest echoed louder or carried further. Lanfert's billhook was silenced. Every creature listened in astonishment to the cuckoo. Bamba the stag raised his gleaming antlers above the bracken. Bessant the boar lifted his snout, sniffing and snorting. Tibbet the cat stopped sharpening his claws on the branch where he was lying. But among all the animals of the forest, there was one whose ears were struck by the call of the cuckoo until they rang with it. Eastgrim suddenly stopped his search, listened, howled with rage and set off at a gallop straight towards the call of the cuckoo in the beech tree. Renard did not wait for him. The way was free and at last he ran off to Malpass. As for poor Lady Ursa, 
After she had been publicly disgraced and laughed at, she still endured cruel torment. Her lord was forced to break away the bark and tear down the sapwood in order to free her. Both of them suffered grievously. The husband had bruised gums. His teeth were shaken and hurt. He spat out the bitter sap along with the wood shavings. His mate had grazed sides. Her body was flattened and she limped on three legs. Both of them were followed as they went on their way by laughter that did not even cease with nightfall, and they were pursued as far as Galarand by the mocking cries of the entire forest, laughing at this memorable chase, which was ever afterwards called Wolfhorn. <laughs>